Uh, I think so. I was just talking to uh, talking it over with some guys. I think so. Uh, so R is using almost exclusively right here. So we're not talking about a supercomputer. And then finally, so maximal cliques. This is uh, for those that aren't familiar with uh, with what a clique is. You're just trying to find this, the the most smallest units of community structure in a network. So all the people that share two ties, three ties, and you just and you build that out and you try to find all the cliques inside a network. So we have a pretty big network here. This should take a long time. Uh, R very slow. Python very fast. So as I was saying, R is great. IGRAPH is great. It's fast, but it's not fast for anything. Uh, my theory was that it might be because of all the nested loops in here. As it turns out, it's probably because there's no pre-compiled C code to do this, and that's why it's taking so long. Any questions on that before we get into the Examples, no. Okay. So, a lot of what I did when I was working in uh, the federal government, looking for, uh, looking at networks, was trying to identify who the key actors were, who were the leadership, but also who were the people that aren't really high on the radar screen, but might be high on the radar screen if the current leadership isn't there tomorrow. So, we have a, you know some quick and dirty techniques that we like to use, um, just on very basic. You know, introductory kind of metric. So we have degree, everybody knows what that is, that's just your number of connections. Between this, this is looking at the number of shortest paths that an actor sits on. So if you have very, very high between us, that means for anything to flow through the network, most of the time it has to go through you. And then closeness is just, is, is similar to between us, except it's, you're talking about the relative distance you are. So if you have a lot of connections to a lot of other people who also have a lot of connections, then you have high closeness because you're really close to most other people. And then eigenvector centrality is very popular. This is just taking the leading eigenvector of any socio matrix. So if you have a, a grad, you know, a matrix of a bunch of zeros and ones that represent relationships, you take the leading the leading eigenvector of that, and that's your eigenvector centrality. Um, our friends at Google use this for page rank, so that's how we find our web pages now, um, which is very useful. So two two things that we want to look for in this analysis are gatekeepers, which are what, what I would call gatekeepers to the central act actors, and then also any actors with low betweenness and high eigenvector centrality will have this sort of unique access. We call, it, we call them people who are like pulse takers. They know what's going on in the network, but they're not easily reached. The way that we identify them is that theoretically we believe that eigenvector centrality and betweenness centrality should roughly approximate a line. So if we were to plot these two metrics, just scatter plot them, we believe that they, would, they should roughly approximate a line to someone who has not a lot of connections, should also not have a lot of betweenness. The more connections you have, the likely you have more betweenness. In reality, it never really works out that way, but it allows us to see who the extreme outliers are. When we find those extreme outliers off that line, those are the key actors that we're going to want to pay attention to in our, in our analysis of key actors. So how do we do this in R? Let's get to some R. We're going to use a sample data set, sort of a canonical data set in the network uh, literature. It's on drug users in Hartford, Connecticut. So it's, uh, it's an interesting, there was a study done uh, many years ago, and it's collected some of this data, some sociologists, and this is what we're going to use. And it's not that big, so we can visualize it and we can see what's going on. First thing we're going to do is we're going to load in the packet, boring, uh, and then we're going to load up the data. So iGraph has this read.graph uh, fu uh, function. That's the name of the data that we're going to be using. And then the format is an edge list. You know, most of the data you'll find out there is going to be an edge list form, but this can handle all kinds of different network data. It can handle uh, everything that's out there, graph XML, um, the uh, graph viz language, tons. You, you know, hit, hit the help file for that if you have any questions, but it, it has a lot, of, a lot of formats you can read in. And then in the final step, I'm just going to one thing that I found a little bit annoying about iGraph is it wants to load everything in as a directed graph. Um, I don't know, for me, I, I, sometimes uh, it's directed, sometimes it's not. But most of the time, we're dealing with ties that are reciprocated. So we're just going to switch that to an undirected graph to assume that all of these ties in this network are reciprocated. Now we're going to do the bulk of our analysis. We use these last. This first line here is create a data frame, find the betweenness centrality on it, and then this evcent function gets the eigenvector centrality. Um, it actually returns a data frame, so we're just going to pull off this vector, which is really what we're interested in. It returns a bunch of other stuff. But we're just interested in that. So we create a data frame with that, store it here as center centrality. Um, and then here's what I was talking about before. Because we believe theoretically that these two um, metrics should approximate a linear form, 
we'll just do a quick linear model against them and then store the residuals. So now the distance from that line is going to help us identify who those key actors are. So we store that in there. We, I don't know if we've gone over the transform function, but this just adds another column. I know there's a lot of ways to do this, but this will just add another column in the data frame for the residuals called res, and we're done. So now we have our data, and now the next step is to find who those key actors are. Any questions on that? Pretty straightforward, I guess. I have a question. Sure. How do you know, like what makes two people connecting to each other? Is it just they talk to each other? Or? In this data, I think that the, if the data on drug users was whether they had uh, shared a needle, reported that they had shared needles, or something like that. I forget the data itself, but in the, it, in the data, it, it, it's, just a, it's just an edge list. So if I'm actor one and you're actor two, mm -hmm. we share a tie if one and two are on the edge list together. That's mm -hmm. it. So it would just be, I don't have a whiteboard, but yeah, it's, it, it, that's all it is. It's just, okay. I, don't, I don't remember how they actually, what they're intended collecting the data, what they did, but I think it was shared needles. I can find out for it. Um, we're going we're gonna to use another um, package here just to make things a little prettier than the standard R graphics. If you, if you haven't tried ggplot yet, it's really cool. It's a great package for doing so a little bit fancier plots than you get in your standard um, R stuff. So we're going we're gonna to do exactly what I said. We're going to plot the between the centrality against the eigenvector centrality. This is just labels. Um, but, what's, but, we're, but what we do here is we set the color of the, of the plots to this residual value. And what ggplot will do is it creates a gradient. So this goes, you know, this is po these are positive and negative numbers in here. So we'll see a gradient then from red to blue based on how far, what your residual is, how far away you are from that line. And the intensity of that color will highlight whether or not you're a key actor. So we have a really blue actor, they're on one side with one extreme, if you have a really red actor, they're on the other. And if they're sort of purple, they're not that important. And then we're, also, we're going to do the same thing here, except we're going to set the size of the, of the plotting, of the, the point on the plot to the same number. We'll just take the absolute value so we don't have any negative sizes. Um, and then we just have some labels in here. And then this, this right here is just another part of ggplot that's useful. Rather than just plotting dots, I'm going to plot the, um, the, the, the index in the vector, which actually represents, in this case, the, I, the label of the node. So this will, when, when this runs, the plot will be, the, the, the dots on the plot won't be dots, but they'll be colored, sized, and labeled correctly so we can easily identify who those key actors are. So there we go. Now this is a little bit small, much bigger. But as you can see, it's pretty obvious who we're going to be interested in. We're going to be really interested in him. He's really interesting. We're going to be really interested in these little guys down here. And then we're, we're going to equally be interested in them. But the rest of these guys, you know, if we were if we were law enforcement, or if we were running a medical, a, you know, a disease study, we wanted to know well, who are the key people that we need to talk to about where drugs go in Hartford? These would be the places that I would start. Right? Any question? Sure. That, that second command. This one, right? Yeah. What's going on with that? This is so. This is what takes rather than plotting just points. This is what plots the numbers. So you say. That's what geome text means, and then, and that's all you have to tell it. And then the options are just the title, so that's just putting that title in. So when you when you give it when you when you supply it with that function, so the ggplot returns a, a ggplot object to this p variable, and then you add this this text. Part. It's kind of a little bit confusing the way they have this addition, which doesn't really make a lot of sense. But you're adding this um, text function, which then takes all of the points in here that you have that it's stored here and just transfers them to the labels. And that's how you end up with that. If I hadn't done that, you just have big and small circles. Sure. Matt, uh, uh, just a quick question about the, uh, the plot. Uh, I'm not the specialist on network and things like that. But what was your interpretation of uh, I mean, this number 44? Mm -hmm. It means that it has the most connection with everybody else. What does that mean exactly? Well, he, He's an extreme outlier in both senses of the word. Because he has very high between the centrality and also has very high eigenvector centrality. So this is probably a ringleader of some kind. Um, but because of the, the way that the, the rest of the data is, when it approximates that line, the line's probably going something like this. So he's also very far away from So he also has a very high residual. 